a couple of good, long, deep in and out breaths. And notice where you feel the breathing. And notice if it's comfortable. If it feels constricted or if it feels like you're not getting enough energy, you can think of longer breathing. Think of the whole torso being involved in the breath coming in, the breath going out. And see what kind of breathing feels best. Energizing if you're feeling tired, calming if you're feeling tense or wired. And then see if you can stay with a comfortable breathing. Think with a sense of ease that comes with the breath spreading throughout the whole body. Because when we talk about the breath, it's not just the air coming in and out of the lungs. It's a sense of energy throughout the body. And that energy is very directly related to the in and out breath, but it's also related to the energy flowing through the nerves, the energy flowing through the blood vessels. And when you get really sensitive to that energy, you can sense it anywhere in the body at all. But for the time being, focus on the spots that are most obvious and see if you can stay here. If you have trouble staying here, it's useful to think about the way the Buddha taught meditation. He didn't often start off straight with a breath. When he was teaching breath meditation to his son, he started with a few other topics as well. Basically to put the mind in the right mood to realize that being in the present moment of the breath is a really good place to be. Thinking about the other pleasures you could be thinking about right now and how they're really not worth the effort. We had that chat just now about the different factors of the path. And one of the factors that precedes right concentration is right resolve. There's a very clear connection between the two. Right resolve is basically resolving to put away thoughts of sensuality, put away thoughts of ill will, put away thoughts of harmfulness. And the Buddha talks about how he got on the right path by dividing his thinking into two sorts. On the one end is unskillful thoughts, sensuality, harmfulness, ill will. On the other side, there were skillful thoughts, renunciation, non-ill will, i.e. goodwill, and harmlessness, compassion. In other words, he looked at his thoughts not in terms of the content of the thoughts, but of what was driving them. And then if the thoughts were unskillful, he tried to put a stop to them. If they were skillful, he'd let them, as he said, roam around. But there comes a point where thinking, even in skillful ways, gets tiring for the mind. And so that's when he was ready to settle down and be still. That first exercise in dividing thoughts into two sorts and resolving to keep away from the unskillful ones and to promote the skillful ones, that's right resolve. And the realization that your desire for a true happiness means following the skillful thinking until they're ready to <coughs> skillful thoughts until they're ready to settle down. That's how right resolve leads into right concentration. You see this in John Lee's writings as well, his, his book on the frames of reference. Getting the mind to settle down, he first talks about various things you can contemplate so you can get a sense of what's called dismay. Thinking about it, gosh, all the ways I've been trying to find happiness in the world and look at them, there, there's not much there. Maybe there's something better. And that's when you're ready to settle down. So what are these ways of thinking? Renunciation. In other words, you're not going to sit around fantasizing about sensual pleasures right now. Sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. If you look carefully at the mind, you realize you're not attached so much to the specific sensations as you are to thinking about them, planning for them. Often the pleasures that we go for, when you actually look at the pleasure itself, there's not much there but the, the build-up, the advertising you do in your own mind, 
just how, how great that's going to be, how good it's going to be, and then the advertising you do afterwards, how great it was to encourage you to keep on doing it again. In a lot of ways, the mind lies to itself. The pleasure wasn't all that much after all, and maybe there were some karmic consequences. You ended up doing some unskillful things to get it. And the nature of a sensual pleasure is it's not pleasant all the way through. It can last only for a brief time. And then when it's gone, there's a sorrow over the fact that it's gone. Whereas the pleasure that comes from the Dharma is not like that. You've done something good. You think about it every time you can think about it, and it's still good. So you're thinking this way, and you realize, okay, I don't really want to get involved in sensuality. And the Buddha gives you lots of ways of thinking about sensual pleasures, how dangerous they are, how fleeting they are. Danger in the sense that when you get something, someone else sees it, and they may want it too. And if you're standing in the way, they'll push you out of the way. Dangerous also in the sense that they develop bad states in the mind, states that get more and more inflamed, and are not satisfied with the old pleasures. They want something new. Then the realization these things don't really belong to you. A lot of things from which we gain our pleasure, they're not really us or ours. And people have control of them can take them away at any time. So these are some of the ways you might think about sensuality. Say, well, I don't want to go there. I want to go someplace else. Other times, though, you find that your meditation time is being hijacked by ill will. You think about somebody who wronged you, and all you can think about is how much you want to get back at them and how much you'd like to see them suffer. This is why we develop thoughts of goodwill. We have that chant every evening. We should do more than just the chant. You have to stop and think about what does it mean to have goodwill for other beings. To begin with, it doesn't mean that you have to love them. It means simply that you wish for their happiness. That phrase, you know, may they look after themselves with ease. You're not promising to be there for them, but you're hoping that they will be happy. And if there's any way you can help, you're happy to help. But if they're going to be happy, what does it mean? It means they have to understand the causes for true happiness and be able to act on them. Which means if they've been acting in unskillful ways, you're hoping that they will see the error of their ways and be willing to change. And you're going to be happy for them. You're not going to think, well, I'd like to see them suffer a little bit first before they see the light. And then you're going to ask yourself, is there anybody out there that you can't feel goodwill of this sort for? And remember, you're doing this for yourself. First off, right now, so you can help get the mind to settle down. But secondly, when you go out in the world and you're dealing with other people, you're going to be dealing with a lot of people you don't like people who do things that are pretty outrageous. And you have to have goodwill for them, otherwise you're going to start doing outrageous things too in response. And then you start thinking about looking for happiness in the world is going to involve getting into conflict with other people. This is why we have thoughts of ill will and also thoughts of harmfulness. And where does that conflict come from? As the Buddha said, it comes from a type of thinking which you lay claim to a certain identity, and that identity then has to claim, claim, claim to part of the world in order to sustain itself. And of course, your boundaries are going to overlap with other people's boundaries. There's going to be conflict. So you, the Buddha's solution is not to give up on the search for happiness, but to look inside, someplace where nobody else's boundaries extend i.e., your sense of the body as you feel it from within, the mental events that you experience right here, right now. Nobody else can experience these things. They look at you and they can't see them. This is your territory. Why don't you take advantage of it? And in John Lee's terms, you've been running around trying to plant your crops into other people's property. Why don't you turn and look at the fact that you've got your own property here that's covered with weeds. But if you clear away the weeds, plow the soil, plant the plants, 
then that property will provide you with all the food you need. So if the mind is having trouble settling down, stop and think in these ways. Think in ways of renunciation, think in ways of goodwill, think in ways of compassion. Compassion is related to goodwill in the sense that there are times when you actually see someone suffering, and instead of deciding, deciding to take advantage of the situation because they're in a position of weakness, you say, no. May they be, be released from their suffering. So if you find that your thinking is running off, learn how to direct your thinking another way. One of the factors of jhana, or right concentration, is direct a thought and evaluation. We taka, we chata, as we chatted just now. You think about the breath, and then you talk to yourself about the breath. Instead of talking to yourself about sensuality, talking to yourself about ill will, you talk to yourself about how is the breath doing right now. Talk to yourself about this territory of yours inside that you need to develop. We need to clear the land and get everything ready. How's it going? Eventually the mind will be able to drop even that discussion, but it'll take a while. So meditation isn't just stopping your thinking. It means first learning how to bring your thinking under control and put it to good use. So the mind is ready to settle down and devote its attention to developing the sources of happiness that are here inside, the potentials for happiness that are here. And however, ex to whatever extent the weeds have grown up and things need to be fixed, okay, that's what your director thought and evaluation is for. In other words, it's getting the mind together with the breath. Adjusting the breath, if that needs to be done, adjusting the mind, if that needs to be done, adjusting the point of focus, the amount of pressure you put on things. If you put too much pressure on the breath, that's not going to be natural. If there's not enough pressure, the mind begins to float away, so you've got to figure out how much. This too is something you need to think about. But it's not thinking in the abstract, you're thinking about what you're doing. If things are going well, you ask yourself, how can I maintain this? If they're not going well, you ask yourself, what can I change? All of this comes under right resolve. It's just that you move the territory in, you move your focus in. So it's a fit between the mind and the breath. It becomes a nice snug fit. It feels really good to be here. This feels like the right place to be. And any random thoughts that come up that might want to pull you away, you've already dealt with the main topics, i.e. sensuality, ill will, harmfulness. So I go back to them. There's plenty to explore here, plenty to learn about. And there's a kind of a clearing of the land that needs to be done. The Buddha talks about a sense of ease and well-being that come from the sense that you've secluded your th thoughts from sensuality. You're just here with the breath. And what do you do with that? Once, <clears throat> one is you try to maintain that sense of ease. And two, you think about it spreading through the body. The Buddha's images of a person mixing basically a dough, making a dough out of flour and water. So that every part of that pile of flour is moistened with the water, there are no dry patches. So in the same way, you try to let that sense of ease flow through the body. And John Lee talks about letting the breath energy flow through the body. As you breathe in, notice where does the breath flow? Where does it not flow? Does it feel constricted? Can you think of it loosening up? When you loosen it up, the sense of ease can flow. And this is how thinking in the right way, i.e. using right resolve, helps you to settle down. So when the Buddha set out that Eightfold Path, there are no 
necessary factors there. They're all part of the path. They're all necessary. And they're all very intimately connected. When you realize that fact, then you can start using the other facts to help you, the mind to settle down. The Buddha talks about right concentration as being the heart of the path, and the others are its requisites, i.e. the things that help it along. So if your concentration is having problems, look at the other factors. Start with the right resolve, and then move around to the other ones, because they're all related to this process of learning how to find satisfaction in just being here, breathing. There was a great comment by Stephen Colbert one time about Buddhism. What is it? You wrap yourself up in a cloth and sit under a tree and breathe? And the answer is yes, if you know how to do it right. And Right Resolve points out in a lot of effective ways how to do that. So you do find a sense of feeling that this is where you really belong. This is where you're happy to be.